So we're going to have a, a very short time left for, for actual discussion. So can I ask that we try and keep the answers as short as possible? So uh, I'll start off with you, Amanda, uh, and just to ask you, you know, it seems to me that we just pass stigma from one disease to another. You know, if we go back 400 years, it was sexually transmitted disease, then HIV, then hepatitis C, COVID, now COVID. You know, should we just say this is something here to stay and something that we just need to, to get along beside? Or can we really, truly, you know, eliminate uh, discrimination and stigma? Thank you, Mark. That's a great question. Um, in my estimation, unfortunately, I think that COVID-19 is going to be with us for a while. Um, hopefully it'll become endemic. So it'll just, you know, kind of go into the background population. But until we have a vaccine available and it's widely distributed, I think it's something that we're going to have to learn to live with. Um, that said, it's not the first time we're dealing with something like this, as I mentioned in my talk with HIV. We have the tools, we know the things that work to reduce stigma and discrimination. And instead of reinventing the wheel, it's time for us to take those lessons learned and really apply them to what we know and to address them for COVID-19 as well. Right, uh, and Linda Gale, there's a question for you saying, so could you just share this could take hours, I suppose, but share briefly some tools and experiences of how we can measure the impact of stigma and discrimination on the cascade other than stigma surveys and such as the stigma index. You're on mute at the moment. Yep. Thank you. I, you know, I saw that uh, question and I, I think it's a great one. And I like what it's hinting at is that we need to measure this in order to know how we're doing. Um, I, I personally think the best way to monitor this sort of thing is to actually go to the users and hear, you know, their experiences. Um, and I think that needs to happen uh, around the world in many different settings. So I think that needs to be done in, a, in an organized and systematic way. It needs to be done regularly. And I think there should be check-ins at regular intervals to hear from uh, users, uh, their experience. Now, obviously, that even that is is difficult because often the, the most stigmatized individuals aren't in the services by definition. Uh, so, you know, we have to work harder to get there. And that's where participatory mechanisms to really reach these individuals uh, in, in innovative ways. I think we've been poor about this in the past. Um, and I think we could improve that. And your point is well made that those tools can be applied in more than one disease setting since we seem to set up and do this again and again, regardless of what the disease is that comes along. So um, I think you have to measure it to know it. And I think going to the source of the problem is the best place to measure it. Okay, so there's a question for, for really, I think for Anne-Marie on U equals U, but Linda Gale, can I just ask you, you talk about U and U equals U reducing stigma. Can you explain why that is? And also answer the question about, that's fine for people who are perhaps undetectable, but what is it more actually stigmatizing <laughs> for the detectable? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And also, could you say a little bit about whether you feel PrEP has reduced stigma? Yeah, you know, and I think all of these things have uh, the also, you know, the, the two sides of the coin. So on the one hand, played correctly or played the way you hoped it would, it, it can go in the direction of reducing stigma, but you've got to be careful of the inadvertent impact. So I think, you know, around the U equals U, there is an amazing ability of that concept to reduce self-stigma. I've heard women say, that's, you know, how I think about this has changed my life in terms of me being a person who can become conceived and, and uh, you know, give birth to an uninfected child, for instance, that, that being one concept, or how people have intimate sex with each other can be, again, incredibly liberating. So I think there is, there's great potential for this to reduce self-stigma. And also, I think, you know, we've seen the impact of putting this into policy to reduce criminalization laws. So if, if again, if jurisdictions understand that U equals U, then we don't lock people up because they didn't use the condom when they were undetectable at the time that they had sex, for instance. And I'm trying to keep this short. I, I do want to say, though, that at the same time, 
we have inadvertently, you know, sort of labeled people who aren't undetectable, either because they've lived long with HIV and they you know, the possibility of becoming undetectable is reduced because of options, uh, or just because they don't even get viral load testing, that those individuals are now outside of this exclusive club. So again, I think we have to be really careful about how we say things, how we message them, how we then, uh, you know, uh, implement them. And this is why I think we've struggled such a lot with stigma and discrimination is that, you know, constantly we have to think about what the impacts are of, of what we're doing. And, and the, the question of PrEP is exactly the same. It's the kind of parallel in the un, not living in HIV space. If I have PrEP on board, you know, I somehow come into this exclusive club where I can have sex safely um, and I'm not going to transmit uh, or, or receive HIV. Um, you know, so that... Uh, Again, I think it can be a positive tool, but how we implement it is, is very important and how we go about it. So we think this through and using uh, individuals who are actually in the mix, stakeholders themselves to help us get that messaging right is another thing we haven't been good about doing uh, in this epidemic and in other epidemics. So I think th those are potential lessons. So great. So can I turn to you, Anne-Marie, because the question was that I think you gave a great answer, Linda Girl, about how it can be destigmatizing de you because you, but there's a comment saying that you because you hasn't really taken hold in, in Namibia and one of the plans to uh, uh, actually make it an important part of the public arena. Yes, uh, yeah, I've seen the question. Definitely it has not been part of our strategies in Namibia. We are currently planning for the interim review of our strategic framework. So I think that it's an opportune time for us to look at any new interventions, any new you know, proven strategies that is working for Namibia also. And like the, the person who commented said that definitely it's a matter of, of, of looking at how you can distribute the already available funding under prevention and look at new strategies and see how it works in Namibia and how we could also benefit from the great results. So definitely we are taking note. We, are, we will also call on the, on the colleagues for their input if we agree it is one of the new strategies for Namibia, but we have not so far implemented. Look at the undetectable equals untransmissible. Okay, great. Amanda, and I think Linda Gale, you mentioned it as well, the problem of misinformation and disinformation. So, so how do we deal with that? You know, it, uh, there's so many different ways that not only the media, but, but, but uh, other methods of spreading this. How, how do we actually deal with it? You know, it, it is stigmatizing, but can we stop it? It's, it's a really... Uh... I don't want to use, the, well, I was going to say fascinating phenomenon, but it's also, you know, it's it's destructive in getting the right messages out. And so um, some, again, some of the same strategies that we've used with HIV and Linda Gale mentioned them as well in her talk, you know, as soon as you see something on social media or something that clearly is is considered fake news, you know, it's, it's partly our responsibility as people working in the field to go in and completely try to dispel those myths and disrupt the transmission of that information. We certainly saw that with COVID here in the United States, that there were all of these home remedies that people were putting out that we knew at the time, you know, did not work. Um, and so it was important as healthcare providers for us to be able to get the right information out. Um, the other thing is, you know, with social media, we have these social influencers, uh, you know, TikTok and all of these other apps where um, we can engage those individuals to help us get proper information out around HIV, around HIV prevention, around the need for care and treatment, particularly around U equals U. Um, and so that is a, a growing body of people who we need to bring into our circle and really engage and work with them. And then of course, having someone who can relate to individuals, peer influencers, peer led groups, uh, key opinion leaders, all we know if there's proven science that engaging those individuals can help us get to the best outcomes and get the best information out to people that need it. Linda Gale, do you want to comment on that at all? Or? 
You're on mute again. Sorry, sorry. Um, oh. There's background stuff going on here. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, the, 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 I think our lives just got a lot harder with, with obviously the expansion of social media. And I think it's a, you know, it's a constant flood of good and bad information. And I can't agree more with the way Amanda has said that, you know, we need to use those who are using those tools themselves to use them constructively as a sort of, as a pushback. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in the whole anti-vaccine, you know, some of this is also to get to the heart of what the agenda is, I think, you know, and then try and tackle it at that level as well so that we can undermine and disrupt those kind of other agendas um, and, and try and sort the world into those who are genuinely, you know, believing misinformation as opposed to agendas that are running down a ro road of, of destruction with disinformation. And I think it helps if we sort that out, because we also can spin our wheels for hours, um, you know, sort of countering nonsense, as it were. Uh, so I think, you know, frankly, again, like a military operation, I don't think we've organized ourselves as a as a world, as a field, to take this on in a more systematic way. And I think it is time for us to do that. It's almost like the technology has run ahead and we haven't kept up with it. Um, so I do think we could get better at doing that as well. Okay, and um, just to continue with you, Linda Gale, you talked about testing uh, and self testing uh, would reduce stigma, but how do you ensure that those individuals get into care? You know, it's easy in a hospital setting you know, or a clinic setting where you're testing, you're there, but it may reduce stigma, but does it actually lead to increase uh, access to care? Yeah, and I think, Mark, at the beginning when self-testing came out, that was a big concern, and I think it remains a concern. I think we've seen different levels of success in this regard. I think some programs have shown excellent um, linkage to care. Others have shown a real fall off, and, and you sort of see this drop in the cascade or a dripping cascade between testing and actually getting into care. And that isn't, at the end of the day, testing is not what this is about. Testing is either getting people into prevention or getting them into treatment. And so that, you know, is an absolutely key part to testing. However, uh, again, I think um, it, it, it in those individuals, if we also support them through messaging around why the import, there is importance to move into the next phase and maybe provide navigation for those individuals. And so again, raising the issue of peer support um, and that, again, doesn't have to be in person. It can be virtual in this era where people are supported through that next phase. And I think, again, some of this is our thinking. We think once people are tested, we've done our jobs. I think we have to say, how do we guide people into that next level of, of interaction? And it's really important that we don't stop short of doing that. Um, so I would say, you know, it, it, it's a mixed picture, uh, but that we should not throw that out simply because we haven't in every case sorted out uh, perfect ways to link. Great. And Amanda, can legalising sex work in countries lower HIV stigma? Yes, I, I believe it can. Um, I think that, you know, if we can help reduce the marginalization of certain populations, that that is the key to being able to reduce stigma, reduce the discrimination and bring people into the services that we need them to have. If people are fearful of the ramifications of people knowing about their behaviors, their activities, then they are not going to engage with us. Um, and so absolutely, if it takes to, you know, the legal or I guess changing the laws uh, on certain books and in certain countries to do that, then that is definitely one potential solution. Okay, and staying on law, Anne Marie, uh, there's a question, two questions really for you. Is, is one, how is Namibia dealing with laws that criminalize same sex relations? And secondly, what's happening about prisoners and decreasing? We haven't really talked about prisoners as a key population, is pointed out, and what's being done in Namibia about? prisoners and reducing stigma there. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, in terms of, of uh, 
the laws. Definitely, we are also not doing well, but we have started the conversation. Uh, we also, uh, we have done a stigma index two, three years back. Unfortunately, uh, we were supposed to release the report in March. We could not do the validation. We have uh, agreed currently that we are doing the validation online. And then we'll release the report, but at the same time, we are also planning to do a follow-up. Yes, we, we, the, the survey was mostly conducted at health facilities, and we may not have you know, accessed the, the people that are mostly discriminated against. But we have the report, and I've, I've browsed through the report, and there are good recommendations. And uh, a number of issues that was already mentioned in the presentation from Linda, I could also spot them in the report. So definitely, uh, when we look at the report, we were also hoping that the recommendations can assist us to, to further uh, negotiate and get the stakeholders around the table for us to move closer to towards uh, the law, criminal, decriminalizing that in country. Of course, it is it's a process. It's a process of you know, lobbying. It's a process of getting the politicians involved, but it's not something that is undoable. We have started, and I think that uh, Salen will say something a little bit later. Uh, uh, we've actually moved faster in the civil society organizations than in the government. Uh, ministries who are dealing with the response in country. But definitely not something that we are not working on and we hope that we can definitely be of really good assistance to, to the population groups that are experiencing this discrimination in country. The second question was on? Prisoners. Oh yeah, the prisons, yeah. Yeah, prisons also uh, another area of concern, but we, we have programs. I think that we have, we can say that we have actually made a lot of improvement in terms of uh, prevention programs within the prisons. Yes, we still had challenges to con con uh, distribute condoms, but in terms of other prevention programs, we have really improved. We were, for example, we had a mass campaign in terms of testing, in prisons, we were the mass campaign in, person in terms of uh, medical male circumcision. So we, we are including them in our interventions. But uh, again, there are some issues with uh, legal frameworks not allowing certain interventions. So sometimes it takes a bit of time if you need to get permission before. But we have a program under the UN uh, called the uh, UNODO, that we basically use that program as our entry point into the prison. So there are a number of very good interventions that we currently do amongst prisoners. Great, thank you. Linda Gale, very briefly, because we're coming towards the end, there's a question about the effects of stigma on adolescents and living with HIV. And also uh, looking at adolescents and younger people, how do we educate them about things like U equals U, PrEP, et cetera? So I'll quickly answer both of those. The worst thing, if, all of us, if we can cast our minds back to when we were adolescents, the worst thing that can happen is sort of stigmatization at the age of transition when you're trying to find your own identity, you're coming to terms with who you are, and you know you then feel discriminated or, or, or stigmatized. And that sense of self-stigma is just enormous. So this is a major barrier throughout the cascade for young people um, and is often what holds them back from our services. So this without doubt is a major issue. And we haven't talked much, although we've implied this notion of double stigma. Um, and so adolescents are absolutely, you know, uh, prone to that. Um, so, you know, what, what can we do in terms of getting messaging to them? We can bring them into the room put them at the table and ask them what is the best way to reach them and engage with them. And, uh, you know, this in this month, we're running our adolescents and HIV uh, workshop as well and really encourage people to engage there and just see young people telling us clearly 
what it is that they need. And, and I think we just haven't opened our ears and heard them sufficiently uh, because we need to speak in their language in order to reach them. We need to use near peers and people who sound like them to reach them in the best possible way. Um, and that I think is something we could do better than we have been doing to date.